There we go. All right. Well, <clears throat> um, my apologies for not having this lecture in person. Um, but fortunately for us, there's a lot of technology available that allows us to port online at short notice. Um, <clears throat> so welcome, those of you who are in Cape Town at the moment, you know that it's kind of wet and wild out there. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to um, focus today on a couple of things that follow on from what we've been talking about um, uh, over the last couple of lectures regarding the Fourier transform. In particular, I want to talk about um, <clears throat> in particular, I want to talk about the idea of the convolution theorem. Um, and in particular, um, I want to define what a convolution um, integral is. And we'll see these integrals crop up over and over again. And it's good to know that they are convolutions. And it's good to know that they have these properties. And I'll show you how we can use these properties to solve some rather hairy integrals that we might encounter at a later stage. Um, I then want to talk about um, a corollary of the idea of convolution, and this is the idea of um, Possible's uh, identity or Possible's theorem, mm, which is a concept that actually shows up um, relatively often in the context of um, diffraction and optics. So we're going to then do an example um, in in optics, which, you know, uh, if like me, um, you've encountered these problems before in, in optics and wondered how to think about them mathematically. So there's this very famous um, optics experiment of the single slit um, experiment where you have incoming light um, passing through a single slit and the diffraction of the light through that slit produces, an, um, produces a diffraction pattern. Produces a diffraction pattern um, on a on a screen some distance away from the slit, um, and what we would like to do today is try and understand uh, that diffraction pattern. In particular, it has a pattern of light and dark um, fringes that get that gets um, periodically. Sorry, I shouldn't say periodically. That that's a very well defined meaning that that get dark that gets more and more faint as you go further and further away from the direct line of sight of the of the slit. So today I'd like to um, give you a mathematical explanation of that fact. Um, <clears throat> so that should take us to the end of today's lecture, but if we have some more time, then I want to start um, the next kind of application of the idea of Fourier transforms. Um, and for those of you that are doing my string theory lecture, this will have some huge overlap. So you will have seen this already before, but I'll, I'll, we'll talk about it uh, in this case um, slightly more abstractly. And that's to compute the Green's function um, for the wave or Delambertian operator. Any questions before we start? All right. So, <clears throat> so I want to focus today on. Um, the idea of a convolution. So um, <clears throat> the reason why I'm telling you about convolutions in the context of Fourier transforms is that convolutions, a convolutional integral actually has a very nice property um, when you Fourier transform it. So let's first just define um, what the convolution of two functions um, is, and I'll show you how this is related to the Fourier transform um, just now. So the Convolution of two functions let's say F of X and G of X is defined to be f star g and this is a function of x um, 
And again, as usual, the three lines here mean that this is a definition. And my definition is going to be one over the square root of two pi times the integral from minus infinity to infinity of g of y f of x minus y integrated with respect to y. So because we've integrated out um, because we've integrated out any y dependence in this integral, the resulting thing is a function of x, which is what I've denoted there. So anytime you see an integral like the one on the right-hand side um, between two functions, one of which is just a function of the integration variable and the other one's a function of the difference between something, x in this case, and the integration variable, you can always write it as a convolution, okay? And this convolution operation actually has a very interesting property with respect to um, the Fourier transform, which is what I want to explore now. Has everybody taken this down? I go to the next page. Yes? Good. Yes. All right, so let's compute then the Fourier transform of the convolution. So if I calculate the Fourier transform of um, the convolution of F and G, This defines for me a new function of whatever my Fourier variable is, let's say k. And this will be one over two pi, or square root of two pi integral of this f star g, which is my function of x times the Fourier kernel e to the minus i k, uh, sorry, e to the plus i k x. and I integrate out all the x dependence. Um, now I know that this guy itself can be expanded in an integral that's defining integral. So this gives me um, another factor of one over root two pi. integral first with respect to x. e to the i k x, that's the outer stuff, times the expansion of this convolution, which is another root two pi, integral now with respect to y of g, of y, f of x minus y, all integrated with respect to y. Okay, so it's clear here that I can split my integral up in the following way if I define a new variable z to be x minus y, then my integral splits up as one over root two pi, integral from minus infinity to infinity of this g of y e to the i k y dy times one over the square root of two pi integral from minus infinity to infinity of let's say f of z e to the i k z dz z here is not a complex variable it's just x minus y and i add and uh, i multiply and divide by an exponential factor to give me a, a factor of x minus y um, uh, for the kernel well each of these things is um 
a Fourier transform itself. The first one is a Fourier transform of G and the second one is a Fourier transform of F. So if I denote these by G tilde of K and F tilde of K, then the statement is that the transform, the Fourier transform of a convolution is a product of the individual of the transforms of its constituents. So in words, the statement here is that the Fourier transform of a convolution is a product of the individual Fourier transforms. So this is important because you, you kind of realize that if I take the inverse Fourier transform on the left-hand side, then the statement is that the inverse Fourier transform of the product of two things is not the product of the inverse Fourier transforms, but rather the convolution. Does that make sense? Yes, no? Yes. Uh, yeah, it does. Okay. So let's keep that in mind for when we want to invert Fourier transforms. <clears throat> um, the most obvious use of the Fourier of the convolution integral is, of course, to be able to do integrals that I can put into the form g of y times f uh, of x minus y. So um, if we want to calculate the integral from minus infinity to infinity of g of y, f of x minus y, dy, then we know that this is the square root of two pi times f star g of x by definition. Um, but this is equal to square root of two pi times the inverse Fourier transform Um, of f star g of k tilde, the Fourier transform of this thing, e to the minus i k x, integrating out k dependence. Um, and these two factors of root two pi is cancel. And this is just the integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the minus i k x, the kernel of the inverse transform. And the Fourier transform of the convolution, as we just described, is the product of the individual Fourier transforms. And what we've bought ourselves here, the difference between these two integrals is in the latter case, in this case here, I'm doing an integral <clears throat> over two functions that I evaluated at the same point, multiplied by this complex exponential. But the point is that 
I evaluate F tilde and G tilde both at K, whereas in this integral, the real complication in doing an integral like this is that I'm evaluating G and F at different points, at Y and at X minus Y. And that's really the complication in doing integrals of this, uh, of this form that you might find, whereas converting it to Fourier space um, <clears throat> means that you have to evaluate the integral at the same, uh, the functions at the same point when you're doing the integral. Uh, if I go, if I go back to this relation here, the integral from minus infinity to infinity of g of y f of x minus y dy is equal to the integral of um, f tilde g tilde e to the minus i k x integrated with respect to k. Notice that <clears throat> x is a free variable in this expression. So there's no constraint on x um, that we've put um, So this is a free variable, which means I get to choose any value that I want for it. And in particular, I can choose x equal to zero. So this means that by setting x equal to zero, the integral from minus infinity to infinity of g of y f of minus y dy is equal to the integral from minus infinity to infinity of f tilde of k, the Fourier transform of f, times g tilde of k integrated with respect to k. <clears throat> um, We can interpret what this means in the following way. Suppose f is a complex value function, and in particular, f is a an imaginary um, uh, function. In that case, f of minus y is the same thing as f of y complex conjugated. Okay, um, so if I do the following, I'm going to Talk it out, and then I'm going to leave the steps for you to fill in um, for yourself. So we can interpret what this particular relation means by, um, by doing the following. Firstly, denote f of, x, uh, f of minus y by f of y complex conjugate. Um, and its Fourier transform, I'm going to call capital F. And because it's the, the complex conjugate of, um, of just capital F, I'm going to denote it by capital F bar. And similarly, I'm going to make a notational change from G tilde to capital G of K to denote um, the Fourier transform of G of X, uh, of G of Y. If I do this, then I can put this relation in the following way. And I want you to fill in the steps and it's very important that you do fill in the steps to convince yourself that this is the case. The statement is the following. The integral from minus y, uh, from minus infinity to infinity of f of y complex conjugate g of y dy is equal to the integral from minus infinity to infinity of f of k conjugate g of k dk. And it's this relation here that goes by the name of Parseval's identity. And what it says is that if I give you two functions, generally complex valued functions, and you can actually prove this more generally, um, although I'm, I'm picking a very special case to, to exhibit to you. So I'm going to leave this as an exercise for you to show.
the statement is the following. Given two functions, generally complex valued functions, um, the integral of the complex conjugate of f times g is the same as the integral of the complex conjugate of the Fourier transform of f times the Fourier transform um, of g. And if this looks a little bit um, familiar to you, it's because this way of writing out um, integrals, complex conjugate of one function times another function integrated over some interval, is typically how we denote um, inner products in the function space. Right. So Parseval's identity here really is a statement about the inner product. And in fact, it goes even further. It's a statement about the Fourier transform itself. So let's show this. And to do this, we go back to our abstract notation of Fourier transforms um, as acting on vectors in some function space. Um, so the question here is, what does this mean? And to answer this, let's make the following note. Um, if I write f and g as abstract vectors in a, in a function space or Hilbert space, um, such that f of x is the projection of the vector f onto the x basis, and f of k is the projection, or f tilde of k is the projection of f onto um, the associated momentum um, basis, then um, we can express, sorry, I should write this as well. So this is what's called Parseval's identity. We can express Parseval's identity as follows. Um, the statement of possible identity is that if I find um, the integral on the left-hand side there, um, sorry, the integral on the left-hand side, this guy here, is nothing but the inner product between f and g. Can everybody see that? Yes, I can see it. Yes. Great. And the integral on the right-hand side is the inner product between the Fourier transform of F and the Fourier transform of G. With the Fourier transform thought of as um, an integral operator on the function space. But this also means that this is the same as um, f inverse f of g. And this must hold for uh, true for all functions f and g in our Hilbert space. And this is only true if F inverse F is the identity. I'm um, sorry. Let's backtrack one second here. When I move the operator across the bar in the inner product, it's not F inverse, it's F dagger, the Hermitian conjugate. This is the definition of Hermitian conjugation. All right. And again, this statement must be true. Um, for all functions f and g in our Hilbert space, meaning that f conjugate is the same as f inverse. And that's the, the, the statement I want to make here. That if you want to find the inverse of the Fourier transform, 
what you have to do is take the Hermitian conjugate of the Fourier transform. Now, in our case, the Hermitian conjugate of the Fourier transform is nothing but the complex conjugate of the Fourier transform, which is why to take the inverse of the Fourier transform, all you do is you replace the, uh, the uh, e to the i k x with e to the minus i k x. And you can see immediately that if we use a different normalization, so I use a symmetric normalization going one, backwards and forwards of one over root two pi, if I use a different normalization, so the one and the one over two pi, then if I had the one of the uh, uh, in, in the one, I will have to have the, the other in the other in order to have a properly normalized um, transform. And it comes from the fact that to find the inverse of the Fourier transform, I have to find the Hermitian conjugate and not the complex conjugate. And the Hermitian conjugate is defined under the um, action of the, the integral. Are we clear? This is an important point. Ah, uh, yes. Everybody, anyone else? Otherwise, I'm taking Batsy to be the sample of the class. And if he says yes, then I'm, I'm assuming everybody says yes. OK. So the point here is that the Fourier transform is a unitary operation. This is a crucial point in the context of quantum mechanics. And we will come back to this in a little bit. But the physical statement here is that the Fourier transform operator is unitary. And in physics, we love unitary operations because they maintain the causal structure of our theories. So that's why it's it's important. Um, I'm going to give you a quick calculation to follow on from this. And that is to show that um, using possible relation that The square modulus of F and its Fourier transform um, are equal. And then I want you to think a little bit about this and what this might possibly mean and whether you're actually surprised by that statement. Does everybody have it down? Can I move to the next page? Yes. All right. Um, <clears throat> the fact that the Fourier transform is unitary actually has some rather interesting consequences. For example, in the theory of Fraunhofer diffraction in optics, the amplitude of the diffraction pattern is given as a Fourier transform um, of the aperture function. So there's a, uh, if I have a light coming in through a, through a, a single slit or a double slit or some kind of slit that constitutes a lens, say, um, then the amplitude of the diffraction pattern that the light produces on the screen is the Fourier transform of the function that defines what the aperture looks like, okay? The intensity of the light in the apparatus is then given by the square of the amplitude. So essentially, the total energy passing through the slit goes like the integral of mod little f squared. Um, and the, intent, the, the, the intensity of light in the diffraction pattern must go like the integral of capital F squared. So the fact that little f squared and capital F squared share a square modulus tells us that Passover's identity is really nothing but a statement, a restatement of the law of energy conservation. Does this make sense? Yes. Okay. So let me do an example to illustrate how all of this works.
Okay, so we're going to do an example of a single slit diffraction problem in physical optics. Right. So here we can measure, we can model the the a single slit of let's say width two uh, a by some uh, rectangular pulse. So here's the picture of what we're what we're doing. So we we have a slit. It's a single slit. Um, and we have a screen out here somewhere. And light comes in, it diffracts, and it produces an interference pattern. Well, not an interference pattern, a diffraction pattern. And the diffraction pattern will produce some, um, some series of bright patches um, interspersed with dark patches, interspersed with bright patches, interspersed with dark patches, interspersed with bright patches and dark patches. And they get successively more faint the further out you go from the line of sight of the, the, the slit. So they produce some pattern that kind of looks like um, bright, dark, bright, dark, bright, dark, bright, dark, bright, dark peak there, like that, okay? So <clears throat> what you would see on the on the screen is just a series of patterns that look like a series of uh, light and dark um, fringes that look like this. Um, and um, the intensity plot of that looks like some modulated sinusoidal pattern, okay? Again, are we clear what's happening? Light comes in, um, it diffracts, and it produces some pattern on this screen. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, it does. Okay, so I'm going yeah. to model the the aperture I'm going to model the aperture by uh, uh, I'm gonna, let's assume that its width is, say, 2a. Um, and I'm going to model it by an aperture um, um, I'm going to model it by an aperture, let's say, um, function. So our aperture function. f of x is going to be 1. Um, if x if mod x is less than a, in other words, if x is between minus a and a, and it's going to be 0 if mod x is greater than a. In other words, if we're outside of this width 2a, then we're in the in the screened region and no light gets through. If we're inside between minus a and a, um, then we're in the whole region and light gets through. Okay, so this is the aperture function. So light either gets through or it doesn't get through. If mod x is less than a, it gets through. If mod x is um, greater than a, it doesn't get through and f of x is zero. This is the intensity of light um, coming through the aperture. I want to com compute the diffraction pattern amplitude um, on the screen. So to compute the diffraction pattern amplitude, We need to compute um, the Fourier transform. F of um, F of X, which is one of a 
root two pi integral of e to the i k x f of x dx. And it's clear that this thing vanishes everywhere outside of um, the x range from minus a to a, because um, this function f of x only has support between minus a and a. So this is just one over root two pi. integral from minus a to a of e to the i k x dx. Okay, so this is just one over root two pi. Um, times one over i k times e to the i k x, which I evaluate between minus a and a. That's e to the i k a minus e to the minus i k a, um, which I can then incorporate into sine function. Then this comes out to be um times sine k x over k Is everybody with me? Ah, uh, yes. Okay, yes. so now it's clear how a single pulse of light, right? This single pulse of light that comes in gets mapped to this sinusoidal diffraction pattern um, on the screen with the decreasing amplitude. It's sinusoidal because of the sine function here, and it's decreasing in amplitude because the further you get away from, um, from uh, Sorry. What have I done? Sign A. Sign K A over K. Right. The further you get away from um, from uh, A equals zero, the sign K A over K. Um, gives you this envelope in the sinusoidal oscillations, which tell you that your sinusoidal diffraction pattern should be decreasing in amplitude as you go away from um, the, the center line. Is that clear? Yes. Right. So I don't know about you, but you know, the first time I, I kind of saw this, I, I thought it was really quite neat because you see this pattern on the screen, you know that there's a there's a pulse coming in, and now for the first time, you know, you kind of understand mathematically why you're getting this particular pattern um, and why you're seeing the decreasing amplitude as well. Um, and really it's a statement about conservation of energy, which comes from Passivall's identity. Um <clears throat> As an amusing byproduct of this last calculation, we can actually calculate um, a particular integral. So let me show you, just for fun, um, as a byproduct of this, let's note the following. So if we set A, the width of our interval, equal to one, then Possible's identity means that the integral from minus infinity to infinity of mod F of K squared 
dk is 2 pi, 2 over pi times this integral um, of sine squared k over k squared, because that's the mod squared of what we found just now, dk. And by possible identity, this must equal to the integral from minus infinity to infinity of mod f of x. squared dx, which in our case was the integral from minus one to one of one dx. Well, that's just two. So putting these two things together, we have really found that two, uh, that the integral from minus infinity to infinity of sine squared x over x squared dx is just pi. Okay. The neat thing about this is that sine squared x over x squared is one of these um, transcendental type integrals that don't have a closed form for its antiderivative. And so finding ways to compute the, the uh, definite integral is, is often quite tricky. Well, here's just such a trick where we've used Possible's uh, identity really in studying this Fraunhofer diffraction problem um, in, in optics to learn that the integral of sine squared x over x squared from minus infinity to infinity is just pi. Okay. Um, any questions at this point? Okay. So now I want to I want to do one more rather instructive application of the Fourier transform. And that's the idea of using the Fourier transform to compute Green's functions. So I'd like to compute the Green's function. Um, I'd like to use the Fourier transform to compute the Green's function for the wave or Delambeshian operator. So the wave or or Delambeshian operator is the operator usually denoted by box usually the box actually is fine never mind and it's defined to be 1 over c squared the speed of the wave um, d two by dt squared minus <clears throat> the uh, Laplacian operator, okay? And the difference between this and just the, the Laplacian operator is the minus sign here and the fact that my time comes with a different um, uh, signature than, this, than space. That's, that's the explanation of this minus sign. Right, and um, we usually encounter this in the context of the wave equation, um, which I would write as box psi acting on some function of x and t 
equals zero. So typically, we would like to solve this wave equation subject to um, some set of um, boundary conditions or initial conditions. So again, this guy here is the wave speed. And in most contexts, it's used to denote the speed of the most famous wave in, in existence, which is um, light. So C is typically taken to be the speed of light, but for a general wave equation, um, it defines the speed of the wave. So this equation here, the wave equation, is a partial differential equation. It's a PDE in four-dimensional space-time with coordinates t, x, y, and z. Um, <clears throat> and as such, because the Fourier transform doesn't change the dimensionality of the space that we're working with, I expect that the Fourier transformed momentum space will also be a four-dimensional space with some set of coordinates. So let's talk about this for a little bit. This is a second order PDE in four-dimensional space-time. which I'm going to take to have coordinates x0, x1, actually x0, which is time, x1, x2, and x3, denoting x, y, and z, respectively. So I expect that Fourier transform momentum space is going to be a four-dimensional space with coordinates k0, k1, k2, and k3. Sorry, yeah, k1, k2, and k3. <clears throat> the Green's function that's associated to a second order differential operator um, is given by the following. I'm not going to expand on, on this much further. We'll do this uh, at a later stage when we're dealing with Green's functions, but really I want to I want to talk about Fourier transforms here. So that's why I'm focusing on this. So the associated Green's function. is g of x minus x prime um, yeah, let me change my notation a little bit g of x minus x prime and this is defined to be one over two pi to the to the um, g over two integral d Sorry, we're doing things in a four-dimensional space. So four over two is two, integral from minus infinity to infinity, uh, sorry, integral over my three-dimensional, my four-dimensional space, or three comma one, and I'm using this to denote three spatial dimensions and one time dimension, um, d4k e to the I minus I K X minus X prime over P of K. So let me expand on this a little bit and then I'm going to I'm going to um, finish this example on uh, Friday because it's going to take me some time to explain all the intricacies of it. Um, <clears throat> So this is some, this is some, uh, so this product here is a product of four vectors. 
in our case. That's a product in Minkowski space. Each of these X's and K's are four vectors. So technically I should denote it by X mu, but I'm dropping off any of the Greek indices here just to make things um, clear. Similarly, this product here, K, this product here, K times X minus X prime is what I mean um, by which I mean K mu X minus X prime mu. Um, and again, I'm, I'm denoting by K here, properly I should call this K mu, okay? And this is some, this is the momentum and it's some polynomial in K. Sorry, that's horrible. Is everybody with me? Yeah. Okay, so what I'm gonna do next time is, um, is show you how we compute the Green's function for a simple case, let's say, um, the um, solving the wave equation with a with a Coulomb potential um, or Coulomb like potential, um, and the second case is uh, sorry solving the Green's function for a Coulomb potential, and the second case will apply directly to this wave equation, um, where I will compute um, the Green's function for uh, the wave equation. And show you um, that it it depends. The Green's function itself depends rather crucially on the pole structure. On the well, okay. So the pole structure of the integrand, but in particular, the pole structure of the integrand depends on the zero structure of this polynomial. Okay. Any questions? If not. Thanks very much for attending. And I will see those of you that are doing the string theory module a little bit later. Um, and everybody else, hopefully I will see you in person on Friday.